My name is Joe Clark. I've had a fascination for the sea since 1947 when I first boarded the RMS Orion at the Tilbury Landing Stage on a cold and foggy morning in February. We sailed to Australia, returning as scheduled five years later in the same ship. By 1954 I was old enough to apply for employment as a cadet purser with the Orient Line and as luck would have it, joined Orion later that year. I stayed at sea for nearly eight years, by which time I was deputy purser of RMS Orontes, by then one of the combined P&O and Orient Line fleet. I went with her to the breakers. In this first part, Atranto, Orford and Orontes are the first barrow-built liners that are featured, followed by Strathnaver and Strathaird. We then move up a class to Orion, Strathmore, Orcades II and Strathedon. Two later parts will feature ships built in Barrow after the war. Some of the film is in black and white, taken before the war, and you will notice changes that were made when those that survived that conflict were refitted for passenger service in the late 40s. The majority of the film was taken by amateurs, generally passengers, seamen and onlookers. The quality varies because it's nearly all over 50 years old. When ships pass at sea, one ship can be in direct sunlight and the pictures tend to be a bit light. There is also some rather flaky film included, but this is because it's all I have and it still has something to add. Sit back now and enjoy it. We start with a tranter. She's seen here from the bridge of Orion. Zatranto is on her last voyage. Good luck signals are sent from the bridge. Captain Britain on Orion stands and watches, as does John Field, the staff commander. A deckhand gets the rockets ready for launching. Ryan gives her a blast on her steam whistle. As the old lady passes for the last time, the rockets go off one by one. Gradually the two ships pull apart. We now have two black and white films of Orford, probably in the late 1920s or early 30s. A blast on her whistle and the ship's away full speed ahead. Most of these pictures were taken on a cruise to the West Indies. Orford heads down Southampton water towards the open seas. The sun is out and the passengers take the opportunity to stroll along the promenade deck, B deck in those days. There's always plenty of work to do for the deckhands. Another shot of this magnificent ship as she reaches the open seas. Unfortunately, Orford was sunk in 1940 during the Second World War. On the boat deck, A deck, there's plenty to do. Deck quoits, and soon you'll see some quoit tennis. The ladies in long skirts 
and sun hats, and quite a lot of the gentlemen still wearing their jackets, or in this case, tropical suits. For the less energetic, pipe and a book, or just staring at the sea, and whiling away a few hours before lunch. Before the days of radar, it was necessary to keep a sharp lookout. This sailor would appear to be at a good height, well above the bridge. The third officer checks the binnacle on the Monkey Island, above the bridge. And here we see the coxswain in the wheelhouse. The Marconi operator, a radio officer, picks up a message from home for one of the passengers. And the bellboy is dispatched to make sure that no time is wasted. All is well above deck and down in the engine room one of the engineers is making sure that all is well there as well. In the storerooms, beer is loaded to replenish the bars. In the early hours of the morning, the bakers are busy making bread rolls for breakfast. And later on in the galley, the cooks prepare the evening meal. Deck boys sound the dinner call. Shortly thereafter, stewards buzz around the table, getting orders for the first course. Back in the galley, stewards pick up their orders. A bellboy is posted to let them into the dining saloon. I bet his arms ache at the end of his shift. Another day passes and we're back on deck. Steamer chairs line B deck, the promenade deck. Below on C deck, plenty of passengers are cooling off in the swimming pool. Having had a swim, it's time to top up one's tan.
For others, it's nice to find a place in the shade. All this sunbathing and sun is thirsty work. As the lovely weather continues, it's nice to have a deck buffet, but there's still the alternative, the dining room, if you prefer it. Early the next morning, it's time to swab down the decks. In no time at all, eight bells. Time now to find out just where we are. Deck officers take readings with their sextants. This is the young Clifford Edgecombe, later to be Commodore. We're going to leave Orford now. She makes her way towards the West Indies. Rontes was the last of five 20,000 tonners built for the Orient Line. She was distinguished from her earlier sisters by her rounded stem. She's seen here passing another ship of the Orient Line fleet in the Great Australian Bight. I grew very fond of Orontes, spending over a year of my life in her. It was sad that my last voyage to sea with the Orient Line was to go with this magnificent liner to the breakage yard in Valencia. Here we see two of the purser's staff, John Manton and Mike Marr, coming ashore in Adelaide. And now a series of pictures of Orontes in the port of Fremantle, Western Australia. Leaving Fremantle behind, Orontes will steam out into the Indian Ocean. It'll be another eight days before she reaches Colombo. From the jetty here in Colombo, we can take a boat out into the harbour and join Orontes. She's on her way home from Sydney in Australia to Tilbury, near London. Aden, like Colombo, was another very busy port on the way home and out. The ships used to bunker here. 
as a duty-free port. It was very popular with both passengers and crew. You could purchase such items as radios, binoculars, and many other electrical goods at very reasonable prices. Moving on, on our homeward trip, we see Orontes at sea once again. Orontes is seen here on her final voyage from Australia and if you look closely you'll see the paying off pennant flying from the aftermast. Strathnava is the first of the p &O ships built in Barrow, featured in this film. We see her first in dry dock in Tilbury. Dry docking occurred approximately once a year in the schedule of both the p and and the Orient Line ships. And from the sight of her, she certainly needed a lick of paint at this stage. She's seen here in Tilbury, destoring at the end of her career. Two p and officers, Captain Chris Daniels and George Miskin, both took the opportunity to film the ship from the foremast. Whilst the Orient Line employed all British crews, p employed Kalashis for deck crew and Goans in the catering department, as well as some British staff. It's sports day for the children on board. In Fremantle, a troupe of Scottish dancers entertain the passengers. Leaving Fremantle, a Christmas tree has appeared at the top of the mast. This looks like pretty hot work. Strathnova is seen here in Port Melbourne at Station Pier. You could be sure of a great send off from any Australian port.
As the ship pulls away from the pier, the P&O flag is lowered from the jackstaff. Now see some rather hazy pictures as Strathnava approaches the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Picture quality improves as her masts glide underneath the bridge. She now approaches her berth at Piermont in Sydney at the end of another voyage out from the United Kingdom. Our last pictures of Strathnava are of her at the Breakers Yard in Hong Kong at the end of a long and distinguished career. We now come to Strathaird, an identical sister to Strathnava. We start this sequence with Strathaird as she was built originally with three funnels. These black and white shots were taken in Colombo. This film was purchased recently in 2009 at a boot fair. So, I have no way of knowing who the movie film taker was. All I do know is that he must have had an important position in the harbour at Colombo. We have already seen some of the colour film that he took of Orontes and later we'll see some of Orion and some black and white film of the ill-fated Orchides II. It's a very busy harbour scene, with passengers being taken on and off, cargo being loaded and unloaded, and stores and water being taken on for the long trip back to the UK or out to Australia. cabins at the end of the bridge, along with two funnels, were removed when she was refitted at the end of the war. Well, there you are, ship lovers. I think this ship has been 
filmed from just about every angle. We can now see Strathaird as she was after her refit. The ship in the background is the Carthage. Strathaird is seen here tied up in Hong Kong. We can now see a series of pictures taken on the bridge of Strathaird. She approached Aden on her way home to the United Kingdom. There appears to be a lot of activity on the bridge as officers come and go. Here we see the captain using the telescope. And now he's switched to the more conventional binoculars. Other officers come out of the chart room and point to the mast. There's something going on up there. Two Kalashes perch precariously as they try to free the ensign. Once freed, both the red duster and the Royal Mail flag can be hauled down. A deck boy is seen behind the chart room. There follows now a series of pictures as Kalashis work on the top deck. Our final pictures are taken from Strathaird as she passes the Cocos Keeling Islands. Here we see a model of the Queen of Bermuda in the reception area of Braemar. Regrettably I have very little film of this lovely ship and what I do have is a bit grainy. As I said in the introduction, Orion was the first ship I sailed in, first as a passenger and then as a cadet purser. I did three voyages in her as cadet purser and later one as an assistant purser and one as the accounting officer. She's seen here passing Orontes. Iran was homeward bound and Orontes was outward bound via the Cape. This was a precaution because relations with Egypt over the Suez Canal had deteriorated, but it was thought that Orion would go back on her next voyage through the canal. As it happened, she was turned round at Malta and the Suez War began. Iran begins to make thick smoke as the two ships draw apart. We now have an opportunity 
to look around the decks of the Ryan as she's homeward bound from a cruise in the Mediterranean. The doors on the deck here lead into the first class children's playroom. A mast ran through this playroom and was disguised as a funnel of a make-believe ship. There were two steering wheels either side of the funnel so that children could play and pretend they were steering the great liner. This little boy, however, has a go at the real thing. Not only that, they were privileged to meet the captain himself, Captain Britain. The senior second officer, the navigating officer, on the bridge. The junior second officer and another watchkeeper are also on the bridge. A young lady receives instructions in the use of a sextant. This, I can assure you, was not part of the ship's training regime. From the bridge we're able to look down on all the clutter on the forecastle. The crow's nest, which we will see shortly, played an important role when the ship was first built before the advent of radar. Another shot of Orion passing at sea this time she's a good deal closer. Cape Town. Note the clinker-built lifeboat. Passengers are on the boat deck watching the approach to the harbour. We have our friend in Colombo to thank for these lovely pictures of Orion entering the harbour at Colombo, dropping her anchor. You will see that the anchor is already halfway down, well before she passes the entrance. As she passes inside the harbour, the starboard anchor is dropped and the accommodation ladders are being prepared for the tourist passengers to go ashore should they wish. Once anchored, there's a hive of activity around the ship. Here's a shot of Iran moored in a Pacific port. And here, Iran is tied up in Piermont. These pictures were taken from Oranze, and we'll see the pictures taken from Iran of Oranze leaving Sydney, taken at the same time. These will appear in part two. Some more lovely pictures of Orion passing another Orient liner at sea.
Rockets are fired and Iran disappears, making a lot of smoke. Here we see shots from Iran of her approaching Tilbury Dock. As she gets close to the lock, the entrance into the docks, you will see the railway bridge lifting. This bridge allowed trains to run around to the landing stage at Tilbury Riverside. The lock keeper kept a very neat lawn. It's interesting because generally ships approached the dock at night. We move on to Strathmore. Strathmore was built at Vickers alongside Orion. We see her first in black and white pre-war. You will note the cabs on the wings of the bridge, which were removed after the war. Strathmore is seen here in Port Side. Some scenes here from the after decks. Here the captain is seen talking to two young swimmers. The interesting thing here is his uniform, which is Royal Navy number 10s. P and O were in the process of changing that to a slightly more comfortable uniform, as you will see at the deck spots. It's quite amazing what grown people will get up to when on a cruise. We now move to Strathmore after the war. She's seen here approaching Aden. And now we can join with the passengers as they join a Mediterranean cruise. Both the Orient Line and Pino use Tilbury as their main port, but quite often when cruising, Southampton was the preferred port. Obviously, on this cruise, the sea was quite rough the first two or three days. But soon both the passengers and the sun came out. The ship is going to berth outside the first port of call, which will be Gibraltar. So the accommodation ladder has to be prepared. This is not a job for the faint-hearted. Blue Ensign is about to be hoisted as the ship approaches the land. We get a good view of the rock through the porthole. As the passengers go ashore by boat, they get a good opportunity to take photographs and cinefilm. They'll have a good few hours ashore here, with a chance to tour around the rock, before heading back to the ship. Once underway, the blue ensign is hauled down from the mast, rolled up and put away for the next occasion. Some of the ship's officers and deck crew check the navigation equipment at the after steering position.
there were clearly two classes, first and tourist at this time. From the bridge one gets a good view of the sea ahead and of all the clatter on the forecastle. It's time now for the crew to be exercised at boat drill. Apart from being a board of trade necessity, it also gives the passengers something to watch. In this case, in the calm seas of the Mediterranean, a motorboat will be lowered as part of the exercise. You may have noticed that the ship is turning in order to make the water even smoother. The exercise nearly over, the boat is hoisted up and inboard. Nowadays, because of security measures, bridge visits are few and far between, but at this time they were a common occurrence. We can now have a look around the top deck of the tourist accommodation. In the early morning, the Kalashis washed down the decks. The next series of pictures were taken as Strathmore entered and left Bombay. She would be berthed at the famous Ballard Pier. All day the hatch covers would have been off and the cargo would have been worked in and out of the holes. But now it's time to sail and the hatch covers are lowered back into their seagoing positions. The next port would be Colombo on the way out to Australia. Here Strathmore is seen from a boat which is crossing between Strathmore and Strath Eden. And now we're in Sydney, leaving Piermont and about to sail under the Sydney Harbour Bridge. A fully laden liner like Strathmore would have no trouble in clearing the bridge. But if she was light on cargo, the clearance could be tricky, although I never did hear of a case where the mast collided with the underneath of the bridge.
on a rather misty morning, Strathmore is seen approaching the docks in Southampton. A lovely shot of Strathmore as she passes at sea. Some of the crew are seen here over the side painting the ship. Here Strathmore is seen with her paying off pennant streaming out from the aftermast. Strathmore is now approaching Tilbury on its last passenger journey. It's always sad to see a lovely liner go out of service and Strathmore was no exception to that rule. All of those who I have known that sailed in her always referred to her as a happy ship. And here she is tied up in Tilbury, destoring. We go back now pre-war to the ill-fated Orcades. She was the second Orient Line ship of that name. Here Orcades is seen approaching Colombo Harbour. Orcades was built by Vickers alongside Strath Eden and Strath Allen. Strath Eden was the only one to survive the war. We have our friend in Colombo again thank for these pictures. You may well have noticed how much taller the funnel was on Orcades than Orion. Passengers line the decks as the ship prepares to anchor. Orcades was sunk in 1942 whilst under the command of Captain Fox. We now come to Strath Eden, the last of our pre-war ships built in Barrow. She will be the last ship shown in part one. We see her here in Tilbury on a cold grey February morning in 1962 and then we see her in warmer climes anchored during a cruise. A very close shot of this beautiful ship passing at sea.
Strathedon is seen here in Colombo Harbour. At this stage, she's still underway. Tugs are pulling and pushing her into the desired position for anchoring. We saw earlier Strathmore from a boat being rowed across from one ship to the other. This is Strath Eden, taken from the same boat. And here we see her in the very busy port of Aden, along with the Empire Orwell, which was managed by the Orient Line. On a less busy day in the same port, Aden, Strath Eden is passed by Orontes. Orontes was homeward bound on her last voyage. I first saw Strath Eden tied up in Tilbury from Orion in 1952. I thought of her then as the most beautiful ship in the world and nothing has happened since to make me change my mind. All these beautiful ships have gone now, but thanks for the memories.